sermon scripture for today is taken out of Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Where it reads, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, many of us have heard these words time and time again. We know the story very well. But we also, as humans, know that we also experience problems. And for every problem, there is a solution to the problem. Problems are part of life and a result from the storms that we encounter in life. We know that God does not promise the believer nor the unbeliever a storm-free experience. But what he promises is, is his presence in the storm and his deliverance from the storm. God's solution to the storms we face in life is found in his son, Jesus Christ. The solution is to know him. Trust him, believe him and his promises, and rely upon him. See, there's a vast difference between knowing Christ and knowing about Christ. The ones who trust him enough to keep their focus on him and believe in his deliverance during the storms, whereas there's also those who only know about him, and they only focus on the storm and the destruction that comes with these storms. And unfortunately, there are many people today that know about Jesus, but only a very few know him personally. The ones who know Christ, they actually value his presence and nurture their relationship with him. <clears throat> My question is, is, can only knowing about Christ not possibly be the reason why so many people today believe anything that they are told rather than believe in the word of God? Many people today have fallen prey to false teachers and no longer focus on Christ <coughs> and his promises, nor believe that Christ is the Prince of Peace and the source of peace in their personal storms. Storms are inevitable in life, and there are always going to be people who are facing storms. Many storms are the result of bad choices, addictions, family breakups, and the loss of loved ones. And these storms often lead to heartbreak, financial problems, and the inability to provide basic needs. See, the weakest storms can have the most devastating effects on the strong, strongest people. <coughs> Every storm 
can have destruction if not dealt with. And will end up destroying <coughs> a person's quality of life and peace. And unfortunately, <clears throat> many people, instead of dealing with the storms, only try to accommodate them. But the solution to solve our storms is found in Jesus Christ and in, his word, in the Word of God. See, to be honest with ourselves, many of us, either do not know Jesus or believe in his promises. But as Christians, we often reaffirm or affirm our faith in Christ. But we also live as unbelievers. We often change God's very word to interpret our own way and to serve our own interests. And according to one theologian, he said to change the word of God is to change the God of the message, and this is idolatry. Many people have quickly forgotten that the first person to change the word of God to suit his own interest was Satan. <coughs> And that when Adam and Eve believed in him, their lives, God's presence in their lives, and their home in the Garden of Eden was drastically changed. Today, Satan has many, many followers who serve him by changing the word of God and deceiving people. So why do so many people blindly follow him and believe everything he says rather than the word of God? Why is it that they do not question what he says, but rather question what God says? It's because of false teachers. They teach what the people want to hear and what they desire to do. However, what they hear and what they t are told to do does not glorify Christ. And rather, it proves that they have rejected Christ and become slaves to Satan. Jesus Christ is the only one who can meet all of our needs. And whatever he tells us to do, is for his glory. Most storms are orchestrated by evil forces, and they do aim to steal, kill, and destroy. The believer, however, should see such storms as challenges that present them with the opportunity to live by faith. Exercise their authority and proclaim the word of God. Storms of life are not to destroy the believer, but to give them an opportunity to glorify God. For the believer, the battle is in the Lord's hands. We can either establish God's victory over the enemy and walk in victory, or we can walk in defeat. No matter the storm, the believer can have victory. Because Christ has victory over the enemy. He stripped him of his power upon the cross. And the grace that God made through him is promised to every believer, no matter what storm. We are identified as God's children, and we have access to his presence 
and his provisions. Jesus Christ faced many, many challenges in his life. But he always was victorious. Because he was not only a man, but was also God. In today's gospel reading, after a long day of teaching, Jesus told his disciples to sail to the opposite side of the shore. And since he was a man, he was tired, and he went to sleep. And while Jesus was sleeping, the devil tried to frustrate the efforts of his disciples and prevent them <coughs> for reaching the destination Jesus told them to go to. Where there was a demonized man who needed deliverance. The only way Satan could have succeeded was to fill these men, these disciples, with fear and make them doubt the word Christ had spoken. The storm was definitely fierce. Fierce enough to make these seasoned fishermen afraid. But Jesus remained in control. He dealt with their fear by commanding the wind and the storm to be still. If only the disciples <coughs> had not doubted and feared the storm, <clears throat> they would have had also had access to the peace that Jesus had and slept through the storm. The real problem with the disciples was not that the wind and storm, but it was their fear, their doubt, and their unbelief. So why do we, as believers, still allow fear, doubt, and unbelief to control our lives? Even after we've trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. See, the question that Jesus asked his disciples is the same question he asked us today. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Faith is God's provision to overcome the storms of life that threaten to overwhelm and destroy our lives. The storms of life are fought from within. Since their purpose is to get us to doubt the word of God. The devil tried this with Jesus in the wilderness after his father had openly declared him as my beloved son. Satan conveniently left out the word beloved when he asked God or Jesus to turn the stone into bread. He failed with Jesus, but he's still trying to get to Jesus' disciples. He's still trying to get us to fear and doubt the word of God. But we have proof that God's promises will stand. We have proof that our Father has his hand on the world. We have this proof if we even just look into nature. Think a moment about an eagle. I know this is going to sound strange, but this is a majestic creation of God's. They represent honesty, truth, majesty, strength, courage, wisdom, power, and freedom. As they roam the sky, they are, as some think, to have a special connection to God. And why not? According to Genesis 2, and many 
American Indian traditions. This is because their creator, God, made all the birds of the sky when the world was new. There is so much that we can learn by looking <coughs> at and observing God's creation in eagles. These eagles are majestic, noble birds. And we often see them on flags and as used as national emblems. For example, did you know that in the past times that the eagle was actually a symbol of the Roman Empire? And now today it's the national bird of America. Eagles are swift. They're far-sighted and powerful birds to be admired. But they are also mentioned in the Bible many, many times. And the word used in the Old Testament is nesher, which is translated as eagle in our English Bibles. It's not, however, absolutely clear the identity of the Nesher and what it is. Some think that it refers to another large bird, the griffin vulture. And it would be nice to know exactly which bird is being referred to by the word Nesher. And it would also help us to better understand the beautiful illustration in the Bible. However, when we think of a noble eagle, these verses that mention this bird give us some precious insights to the character of God. His character as our powerful protector. I want us to consider the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 9 through 12 where it says for the Lord portion is his people Jacob his allotted inheritance in a desert land he found him in a barren and hallowing waste he shielded him and cared for him he guarded him as the apple of his eye like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. This passage brings to mind the picture of a caring parent. God cares for his people. And we can trust that. We can fully trust that. We can trust God to use his power and his love and his support to protect us. <coughs> I'm also going to mention a few more references to the eagle in Scripture. The first, very first time that the eagle is mentioned in the Bible is in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. When the children of Israel had been brought up out of Egypt, and into the wilderness of Sinai. Moses was about to receive the Ten Commandments from God in chapter 20. But prior to that, in chapter 19, we read, You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now this is very similar to Deuteronomy. But God is telling Moses that just like a strong and caring parent, he has safely carried the children of Israel out of slavery and into Egypt. And he is bringing them into a relationship with himself. Now ask yourself, if God equipped eagles, parent eagles, with the instinct to care for their offspring, 
to protect their offspring, how much more will God not care for us? The illustrations of the eagles that God's word uses are there to teach us about his <coughs> fatherly care for us. See, a young bird will feel safe with a parent who has both the power and the instinct to protect them. And we know we can feel safe with God too. And most interesting is that we find the eagle in the Bible's description of God's presence. This is another attribute that the Bible mentions is that they are swift. I've got three verses from the Old Testament that illustrate this. First verse is uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 23. When David himself lamented the death of Saul and Jonathan. He said, Saul and Jonathan in life, they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. And then we'll see it again in Job, chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. When Job himself was complaining about all his troubles, he said, My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. They skim past like boats of papyrus like eagles swooping down on their prey. And then in Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 19, Jeremiah says, Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the sky. <coughs> they chased over us. They chased over us over the mountains and lay in wait for us in the desert. All of these verses highlight the swiftness of the eagle. And God is swift to help us through our storms and through life as well. Also in the Bible we see that God speaks of the eagle's excellent vision. Again, I want us to go back to the book of Job. Verse, uh, chapter 39, verses 27 through 30. And note, this time God himself is speaking. It says, Does the eagles soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is its stronghold. From there it looks for food. Its eyes detect it from afar. Its young ones feast on blood. And where the slain are, there it is. Eagles are known to have good eyesight. And because of this, we use the term eagle eye when we're speaking of sharp vision and being able to spot things from afar. And apparently an eagle can... <coughs> um, spot something the size of a rabbit from two miles away. The point to take away from this is that God sees perfectly. He sees the end from the beginning. He sees the challenges and the storm that awaits us. He knows what we will each need in our Christian pathway. Eagles, of course, are known to make their nest on high, on a rocky, on rocky crags. Whatever the bird mentioned in the Bible is, whether it's an eagle or a griffin vulture, we do have a good natural illustration of one dwelling on high. A good picture of our Heavenly Father. If we wait on our Lord, we too can become in some ways like the eagles. 
we will have our strength renewed. Just as the eagle soars on high, <coughs> we too can mount up with wings like eagles, overcoming our problems through God's strength. I'd like to close today by saying that our reaction to life's storms should be like that of an eagle facing a storm. Because the eagle, symbol of our country and our creator, they never hide from the storms. They will sit, faced, perched on a rock, with their wings open, facing the storm, so that the storm can lift them above. See, in, their st in, a, in the storm, the eagle actually attains its greatest heights. When we stand on our rock, the rock of our salvation, and believe in his words, the storms of life can and will lift us above every obstacle, every problem that is preventing us from attaining our full potential in Christ. Amen.